Hello and welcome back to Japan Memo, the IISS Japan Tier Program podcast where we are joined by experts, strategists, and practitioners to unpack why Japan matters in today's regional and global geopolitical landscape. I'm Yuka Koshino, IISS Research Fellow for Security and Technology Policy, and I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we are delighted to welcome our very own Dr. Ben Schreyer and Dr. Tsuruoka Michito for the second time to unpack the 2023 NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania, and the developments around Japan NATO cooperation and Japan's responses to the war in Ukraine. Ben, joining us from Berlin, is the executive director of IISS Europe and the head of the European Security and Defense Program at the Institute, where he publishes widely on matters on German defense policy, NATO, and the Indo Pacific strategic affairs. Tsuroka Sensei, joining us from Canberra, is an associate professor at the Faculty of Policy Management at Keio University and a visiting fellow at the Australian National University, specializing in international security, European politics, NATO, and European integration, as well as Indo Pacific and Japanese security and defense policy. He is also with the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy at the Brussels School of Governance. So, welcome, Ben and Tsuroka Sensei, to our podcast. Very nice to be with you. Yeah, great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. So before jumping into analysis of development in Japan-NATO partnership over the past year, I would like us to talk about the broader context of this year's NATO summit. So this was the second NATO summit held after Russia's invasion of Ukraine on 24th of February 2022. A lot of discussions focused on the expansion of NATO membership, for instance, Finland joined in April, Sweden is on its way, and then discussions on Ukraine's future membership and security guarantees. I'll start with you, Ben. What was your key takeaway from this summit? First, on the critical Ukraine question, the outcome was rather disappointing from a Ukraine perspective.、Um, as you know, there had been a lot of conversations about how to provide Ukraine with some、um, security guarantees. Ukraine certainly wanted to have a stronger signal in terms of future、uh, NATO membership. That did not happen. Allies、uh, could not. Move much beyond、um, what had already been discussed back in 2008 when there was a first conversation about Ukraine possibly joining NATO in the future. So, all that allies could literally agree at the political level is, you know, on Ukraine NATO Council and on a, a pledge that if conditions are right, NATO、uh, Ukraine could join without having to go through a membership action plan. That was also, you know, partly due to、um, internal. Disagreements amongst key NATO allies on how to proceed in the case of Ukraine. Notwithstanding the fact, of course, that we should also not fail to know that that、um, allies again、um, agreed to continue their significant military support for Ukraine. But I think at the political level, that was a rather disappointing、um, outcome. I think what was positive, of course, and you already mentioned it, was not just that Finland for the first time participated as a full member, but that we are now、uh, on more solid ground for Sweden. To hopefully soon join NATO after then Turkey and hopefully then also Hungary ratifying the accession documents. The third takeaway is, and I think that is a positive outcome from the summit, is that at the military level the Allies made much progress in terms of putting a little bit more flesh to the bone in terms of what the alliance should be able to do militarily. Because you might recall that at the last summit. Allies agreed、uh, on a new NATO force model, which basically implies and necessitates a much higher readiness forces, much larger forces for NATO to be deployed in times of crisis. And at the NATO summit in Vilnius, allies gave themselves a new command structure, which should, over the coming years, be a good signal to making the alliance as a whole more operational. Fourthly, on the critical budget question, allies agreed politically that two percent of GDP is the floor and not the ceiling.、Um, so a lot of allies called for much higher levels of defense spending. Mind you, during the Cold War, almost all allies spent on average way more than three percent of GDP on defense, and that included West Germany. Um, so we'll have to see how that translates, but at least、um, there was a commitment towards achieving that goal. And then finally, on the critical issues that we'll probably also be discussing in this episode on China and the PRC, the NATO communique was quite strong in terms of the language. Previous communiques, China rarely featured at all. This time, the PRC was mentioned over 20 times. Um, the language is very strong on China and its behavior and coercive pressure. It basically states that China continues to be a security problem for the Euro-Atlantic arena, 
what has been declared publicly by the NATO Secretary General on many occasions, including during his trip to Japan and South Korea and Australia, has now been codified into community language. Now, the question, of course, what does that actually mean in practice? But from an Indo-Pacific point of view, I think that was quite noteworthy, strong language on China. And now the question is, so what exactly does that actually mean? Thank you, Ran. Tsuroka sensei, what was your highlight and how did you think Japan viewed this year's summit? The fact that Asia Pacific four AP4 countries, so Australia, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand, were invited again to the summit, I think it shows that uh, NATO is capable, NATO is willing to pay attention to the security issues in the Indo-Pacific region, despite the fact that uh, everyone knows that uh, NATO is quite busy dealing with challenges from Russia and also supporting Ukraine. But still, NATO has sort of a bandwidth to think about uh, Indo-Pacific issues. That itself, I think, was a good message. The scene from Tokyo, one of the reasons why Prime Minister Kishida again attended a NATO summit was that, of course, the first and foremost, yes, the Japan wanted to show solidarity with NATO in supporting Ukraine and uh, countering Russia. That's, uh, of course, one thing. But at the same time, one of Japan's messages was there are other security problems. So the, it's not in NATO's or Europe's interest to exclusively focus on Russia and Ukraine. So the paying more attention to China and paying more attention to the Indo-Pacific region in a broader terms, I think that was the one of the messages that uh, Kishida delivered to European colleagues in, in Vilnius. Last year, when we recorded our first episode on Japan-NATO relationship from a more historical point of view, a potential challenge you raised was the bandwidth of NATO. So are you more confident that NATO can continue its interest in the Indo-Pacific region as well after this summit? NATO itself and also major European uh, NATO allies have shown over the past year or so that they are still very much able to keep their engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. It's quite positive. It all depends on the future course of the war in Ukraine. It looks that this war is going to continue for, for some time and particularly the weapons and ammunition production capability is very much at stake. So the, there is a, some element of trade-off uh, between Europe and Asia and also the, the competition for resources and competition for U.S. attention between Europe and Asia. And, and th- this is just a reality, but still, the, the basic and the foundation why we now still uh, talk about uh, NATO Asia or NATO Japan cooperation is, has to do with the fact that uh, the level of connectivity and the level of interdependence between the European theater and Asian theater has increased quite a lot. So the, for Europeans, whether, whether they like it or not, the, they are affected by what takes place in Asia. It's not that uh, Europe wants to be more engaged in the Indo-Pacific region. But now many Europeans understand that uh, as long as they are affected by what takes place in Asia, they need to pay attention and they, they need to be engaged. This reality is going to continue. It's not going to change. So the, the level of interconnectivity between the two regions is set to increase in the coming years and decades. Prime Minister Kishida attended the NATO summit two years in a row, as you mentioned. His attendance last year was historic as it was the first time for a Japanese prime minister to attend the NATO summit. This year, he took part as a before, but he also visited the region as a chair of G7 and held various uh, bilateral and multilateral sideline meetings in Lithuania. So, Tsuroka Sensei, um, you have been very active on Twitter um, during the summit, but what was your highlight on Kishida's um, trip and what do you think he's achieved um, through this summit? Yes, the fact that uh, Kishida attended again the NATO summit this year shows that NATO is now uh, very much part of the mainstream part of Japan's foreign and security policy. So it's not just the prime minister, but also Foreign Minister Hayashi uh, has attended NATO foreign ministers' meeting a couple of times over the last year. NATO has been mainstreamed in Japan's foreign security policy thinking. One of the highlights of Kishida's uh, visit to Vilnius was the announcement of G7 Joint Declaration of Support for Ukraine. 
It was technically not part of NATO summit. The announcement ceremony took place after the end of the NATO summit, but but still, the, that took place in the in the same venue. And you saw the the NATO logo and the NATO Vilnius summit logo just behind Prime Minister Kishida. And on the occasion of the announcement, uh, and Prime Minister Kishida spoke first followed by President Biden and President Zelensky, it demonstrated the importance of getting more countries on board rather than just focusing on NATO countries. The biggest difference between the NATO framework and the G7 framework is whether Japan is in or not. And at the same time, the EU, European Union, is also the part of the G7. On the podium, not only Prime Minister Kishida, but also the, the President of the European Commission, uh, von der Leyen, and also the, the, the President of the European Council, Michel, was there. That shows that uh, the supporting Ukraine is not just about giving lethal weapons. As long as NATO is committed to the future of Ukraine, NATO needs to involve other countries as well for the purpose of uh, economic assistance and also the non-security aspects of, uh, of support to Ukraine. Ben, how do you think Shida's presence was received in Europe? And also, what were your takeaways of other AP4 countries in the summit? I very much agree with michito san that the importance of signaling during the summit and throughout the summit that this was not just a NATO club that came together to discuss Ukraine and Russia and China but it involved critical partners from the Indo-Pacific. It sent really important messages. What has been, I think, achieved is a signal to China and Russia that we are united on this politically. We are united on this um, strategically. And should there ever be a major crisis in the Indo-Pacific, China at least cannot exclude the possibility that either strong individual NATO allies in Europe will come to support, or even NATO as a whole. I mean, there is a lot of conversation about, you know, NATO as a Euro-Atlantic organization, Article 5 would not apply and the like. But I think if there was to be a major conflict in the Indo-Pacific, a lot of the assumptions that we during peacetime make might no longer apply. And therefore, I think that was a strong signal that was sent from Vilnius Summit. Now let's dive deeper into Japan-NATO relationship. One of the major outcomes from this year was the adoption of the Individually Tailored Partnership Program, the ITPP, between NATO and Japan for 2023 to 2026, which upgraded the cooperation to cover 16 areas, including emerging security issues like cyber defense um, that Ben touched on and uh, strategic communication, emerging and disruptive technologies, space security and climate change and security as well. Suroka sensei uh, what is your observation on this upgraded partnership? The signing of ITPP, I think, is a major milestone in practical cooperation between NATO and Japan. Signing a document itself should not be seen as an end of NATO-Japan relations, because uh, what is far more important is what could be done under the new document. The ITPP is just a sort of a bureaucratic innovation about the way in which uh, the two countries cooperate in practical terms. I would like to focus more on what, in concrete terms, the two sides could do under this new document. For that purpose, there are, I think, uh, three new and promising areas for new cooperation. One has to do with a defense equipment cooperation. Of course, the defense equipment cooperation itself is not part of uh, ITPP in terms of enhancing interoperability and uh, ensuring standardization uh, between Japan and NATO. This is really important, particularly because uh, of the fact that Japan is now more active in doing uh, joint uh, research and development and joint production projects, uh, particularly the Japan, UK, Italy, the next generation of fighter project, uh, which is called uh, GCAP. For that purpose as well, they say NATO-Japan standardization, I think is going to become more important. And secondly, that uh, there have been some Japanese press reports on a possibility of uh, Japan and NATO doing what is called NEO, the non combatant evacuation operations together. 
So this is not quite uh, specified in the ITPP. It's part of the it's because the I understand that there are two versions of this document. The one is open, and the one is only for for authorities and uh, between governments. And the latter it uh, seems to be a, a bit longer and uh, more. They, they mention more concrete uh, items that uh, uh, don't appear in the in the, in the open edition. Yeah, or the the evacuation operation uh, cooperation could be a yeah, quite interesting possibility. And also, the the Japanese Foreign Ministry talks about the idea of enhancing exchange of information. This is a quite important challenge in Japan NATO cooperation, despite the fact that uh, Japan and NATO have a security agreement and the agreement on the security of information. This is just quite basic framework under which uh, the two sides exchange classified information. For NATO-Japan cooperation to get deeper, then there is a step and, and this is a higher level of the security agreement and the security clearance that's only open so far for seven countries, uh, which is called uh, seven NNN, so the seven non-NATO nations. And that includes Sweden, Finland, and uh, those two are about to be uh, out of this framework. Now the remaining five are Ireland, uh, Switzerland, Austria, Australia, and New Zealand. The countries in the West have a sort of a privileged uh, status uh, vis-a-vis NATO when it comes to security clearance and the exchange of uh, classified information. And Japan is not part of that group. That prohibits from time to time more substantial and more serious uh, practical cooperation between Japan and NATO. So the ITPP doesn't say anything about that, but I understand that uh, in terms of thinking about enhancing the intelligence sharing and the information sharing, how to reform what is called the 7NNN system is, I, I think, one of the biggest challenges and uh, hallmark for NATO and for Japan as well. Very interesting. Thank you, Tsuroka Sensei. So, Ben, what is your thoughts on the ITPP, but also all the other ideas that Tsuroka Sensei laid out? Is that similar to what NATO might be expecting from Japan in the future as well? And what more discussions are you hearing on, on the European side? I think the importance of the ITPP is twofold. So, one, it gives Japan NATO cooperation a little bit more flesh to the bone so to speak. At least there's uh, an opportunity to do more at the practical level, even though, as was pointed out, um, the, the, the devil is sometimes a bit in the, in the details. Uh, if we're thinking about the IP4, makes Japan, together with Australia, the most important NATO partner in the Indo-Pacific. Because the IP4 are not alike. Uh, I think that is sometimes a little bit forgotten in the conversation. So Australia, for, for several years now, has had ITPPs. Australia, during the Cold War, already signed um, agreements with NATO to be part of NATO STANAX, so standard and procedures and the like, um, to an, ensure quite a high degree of interoperability. No other uh, partner in the Indo-Pacific has had that long-standing relationship, but now Japan moves up in, in the ranks, so to speak, and the relationship with Japan is much more advanced um, than, for instance, between NATO and the ROK, and also between NATO and New Zealand. I would argue in New Zealand's case, it's just also a matter simply of, of capacity on the New Zealand side, but partly also some, shall we say, divergence over also the, the, the China question. Clearly, it's a good move when it comes to Japan's relationship with NATO going forward, adding to more familiarity on both sides on how they operate. Thank you for that. I think both of you talked about NATO standards for defense equipment. So this has been the focus of debates in Japan under the new strategic documents released in December 2022, both in terms of developing equipment based on NATO standard and testing NATO standard equipment for the Japanese self-defense force use. Japan allocated a lot of defense budget to enhance the resiliency and sustainability of its forces, and they're trying to increase the stockpile of ammunition. But when they try to do that, they see the U.S. and Europe. But these countries are also facing challenges for their own stockpiles after assisting Ukraine armed forces in the ongoing war. 
So if there is a major contingency in Japan or Asia, Japan would probably want to resort to NATO countries for support on ammunition and equipment. But I wondered, Tsuroka-sensei, if there are any debates on how Japan might revise its defense equipment export guidelines to reciprocate that and support European partners? The political discussions on how we could reform the weapons export policy, that's very much taking place, particularly within the LDP, the ruling party, and also the new Komei party, the coalition partner. One of the lessons from the war in Ukraine is the importance of ensuring the supply chain of weapons and ammunition. Japan doesn't have much capability, production capability for weapons and ammunition. And also the, even the United States or Europe have demonstrated that uh, the current uh, production capability is not enough. How we could address this challenge? That's really an important challenge. And in that context, the role of South Korea has very much increased. Now South Korea is sending and selling weapons to Poland and other European countries and also to the United States as well. So how to make sure that uh, we have solid production bases that's uh, the, in, in peacetime and also the, the thinking about uh, contingencies, we, we need to tackle this problem as soon as possible. As for the possibility of Japan's providing weapons, lethal weapons to Ukraine, there are some politicians who are advancing this idea, but uh, I'm personally uh, not quite optimistic about, uh, about the possibility of this because it's not quite clear to what extent we have, what sort of weapons uh, we have that are very useful in the Ukrainian context, also thinking about in a medium term and, uh, and long term, then the, the, it is quite clear that Ukraine's intention is to join NATO, which means that the Ukrainian uh, forces need to be compatible and uh, fully interoperable with NATO standard. So the standardization and interoperability with NATO is the, is the most important uh, thing for Ukraine. In that context, whether it, it makes sense for Ukrainians to, to learn how to operate Japanese weapon systems, and I'm a bit questionable. The weapons production capability is, in any case, the, a really a, a important issue. And uh, so what role Japan could play in enhancing international, secured, assured uh, supply chain of weapons and ammunition. And that's a huge hallmark and uh, Japan needs to be playing its role. Thank you very much for that. I think at the Institute, we've been increasingly looking at Japan's role in the broader defense supply chain as well. On Japan-NATO relationship, I think both of you viewed that how to communicate, address China and the Indo-Pacific were quite strong. Japan and NATO both understand now that the security of the Indo-Pacific and Europe are interlinked and interconnected. We've also been hearing, though, that there's disagreements among NATO countries on a potential liaison office in Tokyo, or rather than opposition from President Macron on this specific idea. And in Japan, I think there are concerns on how converged NATO countries are on China and how NATO's sensitivity on how China view NATO's activities in the region might affect their future activities in the Indo-Pacific region. So what are your observations on this point? We have to separate a few issues. I mean, it was interesting that Secretary General didn't mention a potential NATO liaison office in Japan. And, and even when he got the question during Q&A, he then just said, look, it, it is continued subject for, for discussion, as in the allies can't agree. And, and as we heard, um, France was particularly strongly uh, in opposed to it, which points to this issue that whenever we talk about a NATO role in the Indo-Pacific, it's really difficult to envisage what exactly that role should be. Are we talking about NATO operations in the Indo-Pacific under NATO flag? I think that is very unlikely uh, to happen because simply there is no agreement amongst allies for such a step. In that sense, I think we should come back to what we discussed at the beginning, namely that there are individual European NATO member states that are increasing their defense engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And these are important NATO member states. Do they all sing from the same song sheets when it comes to China? I would say actually increasingly, yes. I mean, increasingly, if you look at the uh, also, the just released uh, China strategy of Germany, they all point to 
the fact that China is increasingly a strategic competitor. China's security and military behavior is a challenge to Euro-Atlantic security. Does that mean that NATO sees itself as having a role in peacetime in the Indo-Pacific? Probably not, but it does have a role, I think, twofold. One, as we've been discussing, as a platform for Indo-Pacific powers to familiarize themselves with what NATO is, with European security, with how NATO thinks and, and operates, and two, as a political body that can make significant decisions in times of crises and war. Who would have thought that we would have seen that response from NATO allies collectively and the European Union, by the way, in the context of the Ukraine? And that is why I, I think I, I re repeat what I've said earlier. If there ever was a war over Taiwan, for instance, or over the Senkaku Islands, the default position of many observers, including in Europe, to say, oh, of course, NATO would not be involved at all. I think that is a very difficult assumption to make. And NATO has shown a remarkable ability to respond fairly agile to such extraordinarily disruptive events in world history. And in that sense, I think all the things that we have been discussing are important because it shows that NATO is changing the way it thinks about the Indo-Pacific. It's also thinking about developing stronger analytical capacity inside the alliance to understanding China, to understanding Indo-Pacific powers. But if we always just narrow the conversations about NATO in the Indo-Pacific to this idea that there will be, you know, a NATO battle group sailing through the Taiwan Straits on a regular basis, that in my view totally misses the point. Thank you, Van. Sudoka Sensei, what are your observations? I fully agree to what uh, Ben has just said. And uh, so NATO's engagement in the Indo-Pacific region does, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, NATO troops come into Asia. We should not dismiss the potential role that NATO or individual NATO European countries could play in Asia. So that if something really serious happens over Taiwan, for example, then it's highly likely, at least for the UK, to get involved in one way or another. And that is why Japan and other uh, countries in the region, like Australia or other US allies and partners, need to think about uh, enhancing interoperability with the UK or France and other major NATO and countries that have uh, capability to be projected to the Indo-Pacific region. As Mr. Stoltenberg has been emphasizing, whether you like it or not, China has already come to Europe. In thinking about NATO-Japan or NATO-Australia cooperation, you, Europe doesn't really need to come to Asia. The Chinese are already there in cyberspace or in uh, on the outer space or the EDTs, emerging disruptive technologies. Uh, these are the areas where geography doesn't matter a lot. And in that context, I wanted to add uh, one element, sort of a missing sort of a piece in, in NATO discussions on the Indo-Pacific, which is about deterrence. Yes, there are, we always talk about engagement. Yes, I love the term engagement. But at the same time, given the fact that NATO's strategic concept talks about not just Chinese challenges in a vague term, but also it talks also about modernization and expansion of China's nuclear arsenal. As long as NATO expresses some concerns about those things, then the logical question would be whether NATO is prepared to deter China in addition to deterring Russia. Of course, NATO's fundamental main role is to deter Russia, of course, there's no question about that, but NATO as a nuclear alliance could also think about its own role in deterring other countries. First and foremost, of course, China, but uh, there are other countries like North Korea, which also has a capability to inflict a huge damage to NATO territories. I think the debates on the idea of NATO's opening a liaison office in Japan have been very much overheated. Even if approved by NATO, it's going to be just a one-person office. The things that uh, such a small office can do is inherently quite limited. 
So it will never change the balance of power in the region, never. And also that it will never change the nature of the alliance, nature of NATO as the North Atlantic organization. No, the NATO already has a liaison office in Addis Abeba, the AU headquarters, but still NATO is a alliance of the Euro-Atlantic region. So, so there's no need to worry about such things. One of the lessons from the sort of a controversies over this idea has been that uh, there's no consensus in NATO on NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Expressing concerns about China is one thing in strategic uh, concept or summit communiques, but uh, thinking about in concrete terms what NATO should do is another thing. So this episode has shown that uh, there's no consensus within NATO on, on, on NATO's role in Asia. And also the another a bit worrying thing about this debate has been that uh, the, my message to, to NATO is that it's not in NATO's own interest to be seen as compromising its plans because of a fear of Chinese reactions or because because of the need not to provoke Chinese too much. This could end up being a, a bad precedent because uh, NATO not doing things for the sake of maintaining relations with China or not for the sake of not provoking Chinese, it's not a good precedent. The debate has been uh, very much overheated, but uh, lessons that uh, we, we need to address these issues and uh, in a more calm, quiet setting as long as the NATO believes that uh, it's in own interest to have a liaison office in Japan for the purpose of uh, coordinating activities with uh, Indo-Pacific partners and uh, collecting information, then it's in NATO's interest. So the, it, it should not be affected too much. Maybe a final question to you, Ben. What do you think about NATO's nuclear deterrence discussion that Tsuroka Sensei just uh, mentioned? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's an absolutely important question. And the NATO community actually mentions China's ongoing nuclear modernization as a problem. And it also mentions the need for NATO to update and modernize its nuclear deterrent. We should also always have in mind that it's not just the United States who has a nuclear weapon capability, but particularly France and, and, and the UK are a critical component to NATO's nuclear deterrent. And in the context of AUKUS, so you know the relationship between the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia to help Australia build a nuclear-powered submarine, the UK has agreed to forward deploy some of its SSNs to Australia, basically making it a fabric of nuclear deterrence architecture in the Indo-Pacific. And French nuclear boats have been patrolling the Pacific as well. If we are thinking a little bit ahead, let's say 10, 15 years time, and we foresee a, a situation where Chinese nuclear submarines are showing up in the high north because of melting ice in the Bering Sea and in the North um, Sea route, and maybe even cooperating with Russian nuclear submarines, then absolutely the nuclear deterrence of not just Russia, but also China will be even more strongly on the agenda of NATO Europe. It is not a topic that is discussed a lot. It's not a topic that a lot of people actually want to touch. But I think the very fact that the NATO uh, community mentions China's nuclear modernization mentions also the DPRK, is a testament to the fact that as NATO rethinks its nuclear deterrence, it should be and must be more than Russia, even though, as Mishito-san has said, Russian nuclear weapons, of course, because of geographic proximity, are always in the forefront of the mind. And with the situation in Belarus and Kaliningrad, that uh, is even more important than it was before. But clearly, if you say that our security is interconnected, and if China is pursuing a strategy to achieve some kind of nuclear parity with the United States and nuclear strategic terms, then NATO has to consider what that means for itself as well. And I think it does. It's just a conversation that is first being conducted internally before it is then translated into some some policy, and then you have to think about doctrine um, and, and the like. 
Thank you very much, Ben. We're now at the very end of the, our podcast, and we usually ask two Japan Memo questions to our guests. So first one, do you have a book recommendation for listeners who wish to understand Japan? I would very much recommend uh, former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's memoir, which was uh, published earlier this year in Japan. And uh, I very much hope that it will be translated into English. Abe's description of international leaders, that is quite interesting. So he talks about uh, successive British prime ministers as well. Prime Minister Cameron, Prime Minister Abe didn't quite like Prime Minister Cameron, and uh, the, Cameron was seen as a sort of a too focusing on economic interest uh, when dealing with China. And that was uh, the, the main reason why Abe didn't have a good impression about Cameron. Compared to that, it's quite interesting that uh, Theresa May was very much uh, highly evaluated by Abe. One of the biggest reasons was that uh, Theresa May was very much interested in developing security and defense ties and strategic relationship with Japan. And that very much pleased Abe. And it was a quite good choice that Mrs. May attended Abe's state funeral. Abe's sort of a way of describing other countries' leaders, that's one of the highlights of uh, Abe's uh, memoirs. I would very much recommend. Let's go on to the second question. What do you think people often get wrong about Japan? How about you, Ben? I'm, of course, not a Japan uh, expert in the way that um, Ishito-san is. But sitting in Berlin, I would, and I have, uh, on a regular basis, in dealings also with, with German counterparts, but also with other European interlocutors, made the point that these traditional descriptions uh, and comparisons between Japan and Germany, for instance, when it comes to security and defense policy are rather outdated. And that these notions about Japan still being this pacifist country uh, in the middle of the Indo-Pacific that shares you know, all these similarities with, with the German mindset were probably outdated from the, to begin with but, and problematic, but are now even more problematic because I believe that Japan over the past uh, 10, 15 years, and, and particularly also under Abe-san's leadership, has moved the goalpost when it comes to um, uh, its strategic policy, its defense policy, the way it thinks about also weapons uh, and the employment of military powers in ways that far exceed what has been, for instance, happening in, in Germany, despite you know, all this conversation about Zeit and Wende uh, and, 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 and the like. That does not mean to say that, that Japan is now a militaristic country, not at all. But because of the way, because of the very fact that Japan is where it is and that it has to deal with China and it has to deal with North Korea in a way that um, European countries still don't have to, it had to change quite substantially. And I think Germany should overcome some of their preconceived ideas about what Japan is how Japan acts as a strategic player in the international space. Particularly those who observe Japan, observe Japan's recent foreign security policy, they have an impression that Japan is getting more strategic and Japan is getting more active on the international scene. I fully agree to that perception. At the same time, on the ground, within Japan, I'm a bit concerned about the fact that people are getting more inward-looking. So as a result of that, there are growing gaps between foreign policy establishment type of ideas and ordinary people's thinking about Japan's role in the world. So, for example, the Prime Minister Kishida has been really active in international engagement, including attending NATO summits. But uh, that sort of very foreign policy activism of Mr. Kishida is not always quite popular among the Japanese people. That sort of a gap is is something that uh, we need to think more about rather than just looking at uh, strategic voices from Japan because there are many inward-looking people and for political leaders, dealing with those gaps is a really significant challenge. 
Thank you very much, Suroka Sensei. And I think that's why your your recommendation from last year to look wider on Japanese broad types of media, include, including um, some of the you know shukan bunshu or tabloid media, is quite important. I think to understand these domestic dynamics. Thank you very much, Ben and Tsuroka Sensei, and thank you to our listeners for joining us on another episode of Japan Memo. If you enjoy this episode, we urge you to subscribe to Japan Memo on the podcast platform of your choice. For more insightful analysis, I also encourage you to look at past research by the Japan Trip Program and the IISS on our website. We also hope to connect with you on Twitter, where we are actively sharing the latest news and analysis on everything Japanese geopolitics and more. You can find me at, at Yuka Koshino and Ben at, at Ben Schreyer and Tsuroka Sensei at, at Michito Tsuroka. So thank you very much again and see you next time. <laughs>